I'm honored to be speaking with you about what we know and what we don't know about the health and environmental impacts of 5G. I have been delighted to work with Professor Alvaro de Salas and Claudio Fernandez for several years now. And it's wonderful that you're having this national conference on electromagnetic fields in Brazil at this time. I have a background of more than 40 years of work in public health, including being a member of the team awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for work on climate change in 2007. And I was the founding director of the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology at the National Academies of Sciences in the United States. I've been an advisor to the World Health Organization, to the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and to the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. My background is available on our website for those of you who would like more information at ehtrust.org. The Federal Communications Commission and the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection have developed limits for exposure that are based solely on avoiding heating and do not protect from the long-term biological effects of chronic exposure. Around the world today, with more than 7 billion devices being used that are wireless, we are seeing effects in children, pregnant women, and others that have not been taken into account in the standards that have been developed by the FCC and ICNRP. That commission, in fact, is an invitation-only group with long-standing ties to industry that have been documented, and they have set standards solely based on avoiding heating that does not protect the developing brain, certainly does not protect birds or trees. And we know now, as I will show you in a moment, that there are biological effects among the many things that ICNRP and the FCC have never taken into account in their current safety factors is the fact that there is a substantial body of scientific evidence at this time clearly showing that electromagnetic fields can damage DNA at the brain of animals and humans, can affect the memory of teenagers, can affect sperm production in human males as well as in animals, can interact with chemicals to have a synergistic effect and can damage bees and insects and trees. All of this has not been taken into account in the FCC ICNRP standards. When we look at what we know about both the sperm and brain, they're both fast and fatty. And the fat is really important because fat has been called a natural hazardous waste site. It attracts a lot of organic garbage to it. And one of the things we know is that toxic agents can get into fat, they're attracted to it, and they can get either through the skin or through inhalation, a toxic agent can get into the body where it can be distributed, and all of the agents on the screen behind me, solvents, ionizing radiation, metals, and pesticides, are tracked into fat. But guess what? Microwave radiation, enhances the absorption of any toxic material in your body. That is why it's so important to understand that you want to keep these devices off your body and especially away from your children because the fat-loving brain and the fat-happy sperm both are storage sites for toxic agents. Now, the younger brain is going to absorb more exposure than the older brain. These images come from work that Environmental Health Trust scientists have done at Porto Alegre, a federal university in Brazil. Claudio Fernandez, Alvaro de Salas, and their teammates have produced this imaging work with us. And we can show you, seen with the yellow-white part showing the highest exposures, that the cell phone radiation gets all the way through into the eyes of a child age six that might have a phone next to their brain. The consequences, remember, that brain is not protected with myelin, and therefore the exposures of anything to it are going to have a greater impact. This is work done by the head of the National Institute of Drug Abuse and published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. This is a PET scan, a very sophisticated slice of the brain developed by Nora Volkoff. She shows that just 50 minutes of holding a cell phone directly next to the head increases the production of glucose metabolized into the brain. Even if the phone is not making any sound and the person 
in the study is not aware that the phone is turned on. It produces more sugar in the brain. What's wrong with that? We all like sugar. Drugs, sex, rock and roll light up the brain, so does sugar. But what is the consequence of having sugar in the brain when you're not producing it deliberately? Nobody can tell us, and we need to find out, and in the meantime, you need to protect your brain. Because what we do know is that cell phone radiation, microwave radiation, can damage brain cells. This is work published by my colleagues in Turkey and I, and we have done this work. You can see the increased white spaces in here means more damage from electromagnetic field exposures that were modeled by a computer to mimic cell phone radiation. And we at Environmental Health Trust have amassed a substantial body of literature which can be available on our website and has been submitted to U.S. courts that are going to be reviewing it uh, at the beginning of this year as they consider whether the FCC must change its standards as we have argued. Among the many things that the FCC and ICNRP do not take into account is the fact that radio frequency radiation has an effect on all living things, animals, plants, the environment around us. The limits have been set not to protect the environment, but only to avoid heating of people and to avoid interfering with the functioning of machines. So we can safely say that the current FCC limits avoid interfering with machines, but do not avoid interfering with the human heart and the human brain, which are essentially electrical in their functioning. It's a small amounts of electric current allow our brains to work, allow our hearts to beat. And the fact that radio frequency radiation and electromagnetic fields can interfere with the functioning of our brain and our hearts has not been taken into account by the FCC in developing our standards today. A number of studies have been done showing effects on animals, whether on migrating birds, whether on honeybee functioning, uh, whether on trees as a nation that depends on the vitality of your forests. Think about what it means to their continued sustenance if you are going to be blanketing your environment with exposures to radio frequency radiation that does have an effect on the ability of plants to grow and animals to survive. Now, as I indicated in my TEDx talk, we know that radio frequency radiation can damage men's reproductive system. Sperm are fast growing, they are more vulnerable. This image taken from work done with Claudio Fernandez and Alvaro de Sales shows that the area that gets the highest absorption from radio frequency radiation is the testis and the penis. They are basically fatty tissue, there's nothing protecting them. And that's why it's important from now on that you get your phones out of your pocket and recognize that there is a cumulative effect from radio frequency radiation on the ability to produce sperm, the ability to make healthy sperm. And frankly, we are seeing a growing problem around the world today of infertility for men and women. And while much of this problem may be due to pesticides and other agents, a significant part of it may well be due to cell phone radiation, which is why the Cleveland Clinic, among others, advises men who are having problems with fertility to keep their phones off their body and out of their pockets. And again, on our website, you will see information about why and how to reduce your direct exposures to such devices, how they have cumulative effects, and why it's important to stop now in that exposure, particularly for our children, who are growing up in a sea of radio frequency radiation that did not exist even five years ago. And the rapidly developing reproductive systems of our children does need to be protected. And we need, their parents and teachers need to understand the importance of never having laptops on laps because that exposure clearly can damage sperm and damage their ability to make healthy sperm when and if they choose to become parents themselves. If we look now at what is projected for, the, for 5G and the internet of things. We are talking in Brazil and around the world of millions of new cell antennas, some located right on, next to bedrooms, in, especially in dense urban environments like Sao Paulo and Porto Alegre. And in those dense urban environments, 
you will need every 100 meters a new so-called small cell in order to connect your coffee pot to your refrigerator, to your car, to your heater, to your microwave oven, to your home security system. The question we have to ask ourselves is if we want that connection, does it have to be wireless? And the answer is no. We can have wired fiber optic cable that will connect our ability to interact and to communicate with these devices. And this will avoid the incredible intensification of radio frequency exposure that will happen if we proceed with wireless 5G and the internet of things. There are questions being raised in China and elsewhere about whether or not 5G is needed. The speed that is promised has not yet been achieved in the few places where it exists. And there, that is why I'm part of a group of scientists who are calling for a moratorium on 5G until we have better information on its long-term effects on our health and the environment. Now we know that 5G can operate under low, mid or high band uh, frequencies. We are already exposed to 3G and 4G, which operates phones and other devices. 5G is going to add a huge amount of radiation to the existing burden, especially because it's relying on beam forming so that the energy that people will be exposed to is much higher than what we have now. That is one of the reasons why I am one of 400 experts in the field, including several who are speaking to you today, who have asked the United Nations and the European Union to impose a moratorium on 5G until non-industry research can be conducted, independent research can be conducted, that will allow us to understand how to create a safer and healthier system. There are hundreds of experts in the field and thousands of doctors from England to Belgium to the United States, including German doctors, uh, Australian as well, all calling for a moratorium on 5G because without that moratorium, we're basically conducting an experiment on you, your children and your grandchildren. If we look at the trees, a study has been published in the peer-reviewed literature from observation of trees in Germany. And they looked at 65 mobile phone base stations. And you see in this image here that the on the far left, the two tall towers are in fact mobile phone base stations. The tree, uh, you can see on the left side of the tree, it's thinning out there. And that's where exposures were very high, indicated at 2,100 microwatts per meter squared. The right side of the tree looks much healthier and exposure is 10 times less there. And this picture taken from 2004 clearly shows that the tree itself is like trying to move away from the radiation. It's growing itself away from this radiation. And we have many such images that have been taken from around the world. I would encourage you to look for them in Brazil as well, where you have trees and where you have towers. And it's a natural experiment that's telling us something rather profound. If a large growing tree is trying to move itself away from a mobile phone base station, what about you? What about your children? What about your grandchildren? We need to start to ask that question and we need to stop expanding exposures until we have good answers. Last year, I met with Professor Cornelia Valdem Seltzum, who is the lead author of this study. And she has assured me that they have many more examples of where trees are injured from their proximity to mobile phone base stations. A series of studies have now been done looking at models of the honeybee, which of course is critical to agriculture and pollination. And these studies have shown that just a 10% increase in power density above six gigahertz, which will be projected to occur with 5G, could triple the amount of radiation in the body of these insects. And other studies have now shown in experimental beehives that if you put a mobile phone in the hive and you turn it on, you interfere with the ability of bees to make honey, and to do what they're supposed to do to protect the hive. And these researchers who've done this work are very concerned about what it means for the long-term, not just for the honeybee, 
but for 2,000 different pollinating insects that are critical to agriculture. It's not something that we've taken into account. Certainly, ICNRP and the FCC have never addressed the fact that this could lead to profound changes in insect behavior, physiology, and behavior. Now, the last thing I want to show you is you will have heard that 5G is trivial because it only bounces into the skin. It gets a trivial exposure. Well, that's not quite right. Studies done by my colleagues in Israel, of Paul Benishai and others, have shown that the sweat ducts within our bodies absorb the millimeter wave higher frequencies of 5G. And you've heard that they only absorb it a tiny bit. As you can see from this imaging here, the sweat ducts have little helical antennas. They can pick up the radio frequency radiation. And you'll see that from this studies that they've done, you can see here that the absorption in the sweat ducts is quite substantial. And as a consequence, if you look at the graphs on the right, you see that the higher frequencies have the higher absorption. And therefore, contrary to the notion that 5G only gets a little bit into the skin, we see that it has a profound effect. The absorption is greater. And the next slide shows you is that any exposure to the skin, including 5G, has the potential to have effects throughout the body. So the Langerhans cells shown here in purple are exposed at the skin surface. They include with, within the skin surface sweat ducts that resonate with 5G and millimeter wave frequencies. And they in turn affect the immune system throughout the body. So just as you might feel well when you have out in the sunlight after days of being in the rain, your whole body feels well, even though your surface skin is the only thing exposed, the same thing happens for other exposures to the skin, including 5G. It's a mistake to say that 5G only affects the surface of the skin and therefore has no other effects. This diagram from um, microbiology reviews explains how exposures at the surface of the skin can have an effect throughout the body. The next image shows you the visualization of the change in radio frequency radiation that will happen in the city of Austin, Texas, once 5G is fully implemented. The image on the left shows you the current levels of radio frequency exposure. And the image on the right shows you the much greater density of exposures to radiation that can occur with fully implemented 5G. And the researchers who did this simulation based on publicly available data concluded that this has potential harm to the public. Other studies have shown that when small cells are fully deployed for 5G, radiation exposures will be vastly increased. You may have heard that there is a 50-fold safety factor for the standards. There is not. And let me take a minute to explain it because it's really important to understand this. The statement that we have a 50-fold safety factor is based on a mistaken idea that studies in the 1970s showed that animals that were starved would stop trying to get food when their bodies reached a certain temperature at four watts per kilogram. In fact, that's not the case. Earlier studies showed that animals stopped trying to seek food when they reached one watt per kilogram of temperature. If you divide four watts per kilogram by 50, which is what ICNRP says they have done, that gives you the current standard of 0.08 watts per kilogram indicated in this slide. But if you look at the actual temperature at which the animals stop seeking food, one watt per kilogram, seen below in this diagram, and you divide it by 100 or even by 10,000, which is more commonly used when you're dealing with something that can cause cancer, then you see that the safety factor should be much, much lower than it is today, based solely on avoiding heating. We know now that radio frequency radiation increases the risk of cancer as well as neurological disease. For anything that increases the risk of cancer, the convention for the World Health Organization, as well as the United States, is to divide by a safety factor of 10,000 or more. So the question we have to ask ourselves is how much risk are we willing to put upon our children right now? What are we doing? Why are we allowing our children to be experimented on? 
why are we encouraging their dependency on these devices? There is an international effort underway to halt the 5G rollout and to insist on information on environmental and health impacts before further development of the technology. In the United States, ranging from New Hampshire to Louisiana to Oregon, around the world, in Italy, more than 600 local governments have issued resolutions to halt 5G. In France, there is an investigation underway on, on 5G. In Switzerland, throughout the world today, informed citizenry are asking questions that must be answered. And I hope that this meeting will lead you to develop ways to ensure that Brazil becomes a world leader in safer technology. For those of you who would like more information, please do look at our website. And I look forward to hearing from you and working further with my distinguished colleagues, uh, Alvaro de Salas, Claudio Fernandez, and others to advance this effort. Thank you so much.